Question 6. A mobile phone network uses microwaves of frequency 1.9 times 10 to the power of 9 hertz to transmit and receive signals. The speed of microwave in air is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Part A. Calculate the wavelength of these microwaves in air. When they ask you to calculate something, you need to know the formula. This is about wavelength and speed, so we have to use the formula V equals to frequency in hertz by wavelength in meters. We are trying to find the wavelength here, so it is speed divided by frequency. Both the speed and the frequency is already given in the question, so you will get a final answer of wavelength which is 0 0.16 meters. Remember that the unit here should be in meter because this is the SI unit and the speed of light here is also given in meters per second. Question B. State two reasons why microwaves are used for mobile phone signals. You have another question here that you should remember or memorize their uses and functions. Two reasons why microwaves are used for mobile phone signals are because microwaves have the ability to penetrate buildings and obstacles more effectively compared to higher frequency signals like visible light. And the second reason is that microwaves have a relatively high frequency which allows them to carry a large amount of information in a short amount of time. Question C. All mobile phone networks use digital signals to communicate with the phone. You should know that there are two types of signals when it comes to transferring information. They are called analog and digital. An analog system is continuous and varies smoothly over time. For example, it's the sound wave produced by a person's voice when they are talking. Whereas a digital signal is discrete and consists of individual data points or bits. For example, they are like binary data used in computers which is represented as sequences of zeros and ones. The question suggests that with the aid of diagram, you can explain how they differ. So here's what the representation looks like. Part 2 State two advantages of using digital signals rather than analog signals. These are some of the advantages of using digital signals rather than analog signals. Since this question only gives you two marks, only two points are required, but I've given you some extra for a reference. Question 7. Figure 7.1 shows a circuit that contains a battery, a switch, a voltmeter and three resistors with 40 ohms. The switch is open and resistor R1 and R2 form a potential divider. A potential divider is a circuit arrangement consisting of two or more resistors connected in parallel. Question A. Describe what is meant by a potential divider. Two marks. A potential divider splits or shares the EMF or voltage in a circuit between the components in proportion to the resistance. The components in this circuit would be your resistors. Question B. The reading on the voltmeter is 7.5 voltage. Part 1. Calculate the electromotive force of the battery. It's mentioned here that the switch is open. It means that the circuit is incomplete and no current flows through it. So this means that the voltmeter reading is actually the EMF of the battery. Since there are two batteries here, the electromotive force of the battery will be 7.5 voltage times 2, which gives us a value of 15 voltage. Part B. The switch is closed. Calculate the resistance of the complete circuit. Now let's look at the diagram. We can see that R1 and R2 are connected in series, whereas R2 and R3 are connected in parallel. So in order to calculate the resistance of the complete circuit, we have to first calculate the combined resistance of R2 and R3 where the formula of resistance in parallel is 
1 over r total equals to 1 over r2 plus 1 over r3. We have been given that each resistor has a resistance of 40 ohms. So for this part of the circuit, we have 20 ohms. This part is 20 ohms. But we are not done here as we still haven't calculated R1. We can combine the total resistance of R2 and R3 into one resistor that is connected in parallel to R1. In a series circuit, the formula to find resistance is just the sum of all the resistors, which in this case would be 40 ohm plus 20 ohm. And you will get a total resistance for the complete circuit at 60 ohms. Next, question C. Calculate the reading on the voltmeter when the switch is closed. According to Ohm's law, we know that voltage equals to current times resistance. But we are not given current in this question, so we can't use this formula. So let's think for a second which formula can be used here. You have two resistors, resistors 2 and resistor 1, forming a potential divider. So you can use the formula of potential divider to calculate the voltmeter. This is the formula of potential divider. So let's identify what are the values for R1, R2, V1 and V2. The reading of R1 is given which is 40 ohms. And the reading of R2 will be the combined resistance of the whole circuit which is 60 ohm. Since I'm taking the resistance of the whole circuit, I will be also using the voltage reading for the entire circuit which is 15 voltage as calculated previously in question B part 1. So we are only left to find V1. So to calculate V1, it will be 40 over 60 ohm times with 15 voltage which will give you a reading of 10 voltage. Question 8. The electricity supplied to a town is transmitted using a high voltage cable. A transformer in the town has a soft iron core. The purpose of a transformer is to change the size of the alternating voltage. Question A. Explain the principle of operation of a simple iron core transformer. You must know how a transformer works, otherwise you could lose the 4 marks given over here. A simple iron cord transformer operates by electromagnetic induction. The alternating current in the primary coil creates a change in magnetic field. This then induces a change in magnetic flux in the core, which links with the secondary coil causing an induced voltage. Question B. The transformer steps the supply voltage down from 220,000 voltage to 33,000 voltage. This means that this is a step down transformer as the voltage moves from a higher number to a smaller number. Part 1. There are 450 turns in the secondary coil and they want you to calculate the number of turns on the primary coil. To calculate the number of turns in the primary coil of the transformer, you can use the turns ratio formula. And we are looking for the number of turns in the primary coil, which is this. So let's just substitute all the values given in the question into our formula. After rearranging and calculating this, you will get a number of turns, which is equals to 3000 turns. Part B. The electrical power transferred to the transformer by the high voltage cable is 77 megawatts. Calculate the current in the primary coil. There are some formulas related to power that you must know. They want you to find the current in the primary coil. And you are already given the voltage in the primary coil. So you have the voltage and you have power. This means that you can use the formula of power equals to voltage times current to find our current. 
But the power given here is in megawatts and we have to convert it to watts because this is the SI unit. Megawatts is 10 to the power of 6 equals to the primary coil voltage which is 220,000 voltage times current. You will get the value of current which is 350 and the unit is amperes. Please do not forget to write your units at the end of your answers. Next question. Question 9. Figure 9.1 represents all the particles in a neutral atom of a radioactive isotope X1. Before answering the question, let's look into the structure. There are 5 electrons on the shell of this atom and a total of 12 protons plus neutrons in the nucleus of this atom. It consists of 5 white particles and 7 grey particles. Since an atom has an equal number of protons and electrons, the white particles would represent the proton number, leaving the gray particles to be your neutron number. So, question A. Determine the number of neutrons in this atom and explain how the answer is obtained. As we have figured it out, the number of neutrons would be 7. And the explanation is that the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons. This means that the white particles are protons and the remaining particles, which is the gray particles, would represent neutrons. Question B. The isotope X1 is a beta emitter that decays to the stable isotope X2. So this is what the nuclide notation would look like. Part 1. Describe how a nucleus of X2 differs from the nucleus of X1. A nucleus contains protons and neutrons, so we can use this information to compare the difference between X2 and X1. The isotope X1 has a total of 12 protons and neutrons and 6 protons. The mass number before and after should be equal meaning that it will still remain 12 here. And at the bottom, it should be the same. The number before and after should both be 6. So I'm going to put a 7 here because 7 plus negative 1 will give me a total of 6. Now we can see that X1 has 6 protons whereas X2 has 7 protons. Part 2 Suggest why isotope X2 is stable whereas X1 is not stable. Isotopes become unstable when there are too many number of neutrons. So X2 is stable because there is no excess neutrons in the nucleus of the atom. Question C. The half-life of X1 is approximately 20 milliseconds. Part 1. Define the term half-life. Okay, this is a definition question, so make sure you remember how to define this term. Half-life is the time taken for a number of radioactive nuclei to become half. Part 2. Suggest one reason why isotopes with very short life are especially hazardous. This is because they decay rapidly which releases a significant amount of radiation in a very short period of time. Question 10. Pluto is a dwarf planet. Figure 10.1 shows the direction of motion of Pluto as it follows its elliptical orbit around the Sun. So as we can see here, there is point X and point Y. Point X is closer to the Sun and point Y is further from the Sun. And the direction of Pluto is moving at an anti-clockwise direction. Question A. Point X is the point of the orbit closest to the Sun and point Y is the point furthest away. The orbital speed of Pluto varies as it orbits the Sun. Part 1. Describe how the speed of Pluto varies as it moves from X to Y and then back to X. And part 2 wants you to explain, in terms of energy transfer, why the speed of Pluto varies in this way. So before addressing this question, let me provide you with a more detailed explanation. According to the principle of conservation of energy, the total energy of a system always stays the same. So we are going to apply this to the motion of the planet. 
The total energy of Pluto is equal to its kinetic energy plus its gravitational potential energy. So as Pluto approaches the Sun, which is the closest distance to the Sun, it gains kinetic energy and loses its gravitational potential energy. And as the Pluto travels away from the Sun, which is the furthest from the Sun, it will gain the highest gravitational potential energy and loses its kinetic energy. So the speed varies in a way that when it is closest to the Sun, it has a higher speed and as it moves away from the sun, it has a lower speed. So for part 1 to describe how the speed of Pluto varies, you can say that from x to y, the speed decreases. And in terms of energy transfers for three marks, you can explain using the principle of conservation of energy. The arrow that point down stands for decreases and the arrow that point up stands for increases. Please do not write the way that I have written this but instead use words to describe your answer. Question B. The average temperature on the surface of Pluto is 43 Kelvin. Part 1. Convert this temperature to a value in degrees Celsius. Temperature in degrees Celsius is the temperature in Kelvin minus 273.15 Kelvin. So 43 Kelvin minus 273.15 Kelvin will give us a temperature in degrees Celsius which is negative 230.15 which is approximately negative 230 degrees Celsius. Part 2. Pluto has a white surface as shown in figure 10.2. As Pluto rotates, the white surface alternately faces towards and away from the sun. Explain how this affects the temperature of Pluto as it rotates on its own axis. When the white surface is facing the sun, there will be an increase in temperature. Alternatively, as it faces away from the sun, it will experience a decrease in temperature. That is all for this paper. Thank you so much for watching. If this video was helpful, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Bye!